So my name is Rebecca Elder and I am a preservation consultant based in Austin, Texas. And I am here to talk to you all about personal safety when you're working with your collection because there are so many things that can harm you that we find in museum collections everywhere. And I think it's important to take care of yourself. So today we're going to talk about the kinds of dangers you're going to find in collections how to identify hazardous materials, how to manage the risks that you find once you identify them. We're going to talk about personal protective equipment. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about if you have a disaster and you're responding to that, what you can do to stay safe, because that's a special circumstance. Excellent. Come on in. If you only take one thing away from this, the one thing is that your health and safety is more important than any object. We can get more stuff, but we can't get another you, so it's really important to safeguard your health. So starting out, just defining hazards. Um, hazards are any material that has the potential to cause injury, illness, or death, cause damage or loss, or inhibit operations, and that's a definition that I took from the American Institute for Conservation, Health and Safety wiki. But I think it's a good one. And then we can break that down further into two categories. There are inherent hazards, and there are hazards that are acquired over time. So inherent, inherent hazards are things that are hazardous at the time of manufacture and stay hazardous into perpetuity. So things could be arsenic and taxidermy mounts, that's one we like to talk about a lot. Um, poison tips on arrowheads and weapons. Early fire extinguishing equipment tended to be glass balls filled with carbon tetrachloride. You would throw it at the fire and it would extinguish it. It's also highly carcinogenic. Mercury in thermometers and 18th century mirrors have mercury in them. Lead in bullets or stained glass or glazed ceramics or just lead metal. Um, I have a collection of lead printers type that I can't touch with my bare hands because it's lead. Um, medical equipment, if it's been used, there may be poisons or pathogens on it. Old medicine. There are a lot of scary things in old medicine. If you have a collection of old medicine bottles, pills, potions, patent medicines. You want to think very carefully about how you're going to handle that. Um, there can be just physical characteristics. Sharp knives. A sharp knife can cut you. Um, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Yay. Acquired hazards are things that get added to your object over time or as the object deteriorates. One we like to talk about a lot is pesticides, because there are a lot of pesticides used in ethnographic collections. Hi, come on in. We use preservatives like formaldehyde and ethanol to care for biological samples. Some things deteriorate. The one we talk about a lot is cellulose nitrate film. When cellulose nitrate deteriorates, over time, it forms nitric acid. But the thing that becomes, which is a health hazard, it also is a collections hazard because it burns. You can, it burns spontaneously, and you cannot extinguish it. Um, if you have a roll of cellulose, a reel of cellulose acetate film that's on fire, it creates its own oxygen. So you can't douse it in water or douse it in anything. It just keeps burning even if you submerge it in a bathtub of water. Kind of scary. And then there are things like mold, frass, which are insect droppings, bird droppings, bat droppings, depending on your building. Um, so all kinds of things, you name it, it's probably in a collection. It's probably bad for you. We should probably think about how the body absorbs toxins so we can think about protecting ourselves. Um, 
So there's three ways. Skin contact. If your skin is uncompromised, it's a pretty good barrier. But if you have any kind of a puncture or a scrape or a cut or a wound, things can come in through that. And once the substance is in your bloodstream, there's the problem. Where is my cursor on this? I'm going to, I don't trust, I don't trust Windows computers. I'm going to use my iPad. Um, inhalation. That's a pretty easy one to understand. You breathe something in, it gets into the mucous membranes in your nose, into your bloodstream, and all of a sudden, you're in trouble. And then ingestion. Chances are you're not actually going to purposefully eat something, but you know if you put down something, pick it up, bite your fingernails, bam, you have just eaten something you do not want to be eating. So hopefully, or not, you are sufficiently terrified of everything. But, you know, it's better to be a little bit too careful than not careful enough. However, there's a difference between a hazard and a risk. Hazard is inherent. You can't change what the hazard is. The hazard, if you have a taxidermy mount that has arsenic in it, the arsenic isn't going anywhere unless you have a fancy conservator who's going to work on it for you. But you can control the risks, which is really good news. Um, the risk is the possibility that the hazard will cause harm and the degree to which it will affect you. So you can, you can work with that. The first step is you want to identify the hazards that you have. Right, that makes sense. Uh, ways to do that, you, you know a lot about the materials in your collection and there's more material out there if you don't know everything. Um, but if you smell vinegar around film, you probably have some kind of vinegar syndrome going on in the film. It's producing acetic acid, which is a hazard for your lungs. If you have taxidermy, you know that a lot of taxidermy pre-1970s or so used arsenic as a preservative. And you can just assume that it's going to be in there. If somebody donates a firearm to you, you just know right off the bat that until it's proven otherwise, you assume that it's armed and dangerous. Um, arsenic used as a pesticide sometimes manifests itself as a white powder on organic materials. We can't guarantee that a white powder is arsenic, but it's definitely a sign to keep, to keep your eyes open. So your inherent knowledge of the material is helpful. The next thing to look at is historic records. Does your museum keep any records on any kinds of pesticides that were used? If so, you know that those pesticides are in your collection. And on the same note, if you open up a, a supply cupboard and see some kind of a can of pesticide, you can assume that that's in your collections too. If something is donated, what kind of history do you have on the object? You know, if you know who the person it was donated from and you can say, this looks really good, how have you taken care of it? And they say, well, we think my grandmother put it in mothballs. Mothballs are a poison, you know that's there. And then you can look at things like brand names. For example, anything that's like Rady or Rad, especially if it glowed in the dark at one point in time, had radium in it, which is, what's the word I'm looking for? Radio. Radio, thank you. It's been a long conference, yes, radioactive. And even though it may not be glowing in the dark anymore, it's still radioactive. Uh, and if you ever want to read some really, really scary, sad stories, you should read about things like the girls who painted watch faces with the little radium paint numbers and then painted themselves so that they would glow in the dark and then all died of cancer. I know that's such, I'm sorry, that's a real downer. But 
They're really sad stories. Um, so radi or rad, potentially radium. And then the last thing is you want to know your environment. Do you know what your humidity is? Do you have spaces that are prone to mold invasion? <coughs> Do you know that spiders come in every year because they're feeding on some other insect? Uh, do you have asbestos in your ceilings or your walls? Um, is that falling down? I worked with somebody once who had collections in a very neglected building and had something crumbling over top of them that they were deathly terrified was asbestos falling down on their, arch on their archival records. They had it tested, found out it wasn't, but they stayed well away until they did. And you might have lead paint on your walls still that hasn't been painted over several times with latex. And then the last thing, which is probably the most definitive, is actual testing. <coughs> Excuse me. You, there's chemical testing, which generally there's spot tests and or more sophisticated things like mass spectrometry, portable X-ray fluorescence. For radiation, you could use a Geiger counter. The testing identifies the contaminants only. It doesn't identify what the risk associated with them is. Right, so I could say, oh look, I've tested this, it has arsenic. It doesn't tell me really how much arsenic or what danger I'm in. And all testing should be performed by a trained conservator. Um, one thing that you should know is MAC, which is the Midwest Art Conservation Center, does really inexpensive arsenic testing by mail. You can send them swabs of your artifact, and their objects conservator will run the artifacts testing, the arsenic testing, and get you the results so that you know if there's something you suspect of having arsenic in it. So that is a nifty little service and somebody who's trained to do it will do it well can tell you definitively. You can look at so for signs of pesticide use. If something is in fantastic condition compared to other similar objects of the same age, same composition, uh, you might have some pesticide use. If you see something that's marked as poison, that's a good sign. If you see a fine white dust or crystals or some kind of a colored efflorescence, kind of, you know, some kind of an outgrowth. And those are signs from the fantastic book, Caring for, for American Indian Objects. I think it should be on the references, and that's the chapter on safety by pesticide contamination by Nancy Odegaard who is presenting multiple sessions, not, not this one, um, well worth reading and having. The bottom line is better safe than sorry. Suspect anything that you can't easily identify. If you don't know what it is, just assume the worst. So we have now identified our hazards, and we can go on to managing, managing them. And there are three basic risk management strategies that you can take. The first is removing the object and replacing it or substituting. The second is isolating the object. And the third is safe work practices. And these are in order of preference. And talk a little more about each of them. Um, if you need help figuring this out, you have a couple of options. Your local environmental safety agency may be able to help you. If you're affiliated with a college or university, they probably have an industrial safety department. Um, your city or town may, your state will. OSHA, the Occupational Self Safety and Health Administration, also has a free small business consultation service where they'll come in and help you identify what the hazards are for exposure. Um, it's free and it's confidential. As long as you work to correct the hazards, they're not going to find you know find you or report you for any violations. They're going to work with you to fix them so they don't have to. So the strategies: 
Remove and replace. This is the most desirable, right? The safest thing to do is to just get rid of the hazard. However, it's not often possible in museum collections, right? It's in your collection because it's important. You can't just pitch it because it might be dangerous. But ideally, you could dispose of the contaminated object. How do you dispose of it? Well, it depends on what you're disposing of. If it's just in a library, you might have a moldy book that's a collection hazard and a health hazard, but you could just throw that in the dumpster. If you have cellulose nitrate film, you can't just throw that in the dumpster. You need to call your local hazardous waste agency and ask them what the legal regulations are in, um, in connection with that. A taxidermy object, I would talk to my, to the local hazardous waste people and say, I've got this piece of taxidermy that I suspect has arsenic in it. How do I dispose of it safely and legally <clears throat> here? Um, it's probably not going to be throw it in the dumpster. It's probably going to be bring it to our hazardous waste disposal facility and we'll take it from there. But you want to be safe. You want and you don't want to start throwing arsenic out into the environment or pesticides out into the environment because there's enough already. So disposing of the contaminated object is an option. Potentially you can remediate the contaminant. That's often going to be something a conservator would do, when you're, especially when you're dealing with very toxic chemicals. But if it's something that has a little mold on it, you might be able to clean the mold yourself and then just label it, which we'll talk about in a minute that it's been contaminated with mold. You want to process things quickly as they come in to make sure you know, and examine them to see what you think the risk is. So that if you, know, if you do it quickly, they aren't going to sit around for a long time contaminating everything else in their vicinity. And yeah, dispose of hazardous waste in, in accordance with your local regulations. Really call up the people and talk to them. If you have cellulose nitrate film in your collections, there's every chance that the fire department will want it to run simulations and fires on. Take it back and explode it and give their fire, firemen a going over. So that's remove and replace. It's a nice idea, not necessarily practical unless it's something that you can say, for example, digitize and replace. Or if you have half a dozen similar objects and you think one is contaminated, you may decide that if you have, we have five more that are just like it, we don't need to keep this one. We don't have the space in our collections anyhow. Um, the next is isolation. That may be the easiest way to do things, but isolation also restricts access. However, you should restrict access to anything that's hazardous because you don't want everyone getting their grubby mitts all over it and hurting themselves. So you can use well-sealed bags or containers. If you want to store things in a drawer, you can store them in a drawer under a sheet of acrylic. That'll work. But then what do you do with the drawer once you take care of this thing? Do you have to replace it? It's, it's, no, once you, once you decide that you're going to isolate it in the drawer, that drawer is pretty much your hazardous materials drawer. I, mean, I suppose if you eventually decided to deaccession it or you decided to pay someone to decontaminate it, if it could be decontaminated, which may or not be possible, you, if it's a metal drawer, you can probably clean the drawer really, really, really well and let it air out for a few days, or you could just buy a replacement drawer. But well-sealed bags or well-sealed containers, like plastic containers with a silicone gasket around the top, are probably the easiest bet. I'm feeling like drawers under acrylic is probably a very high-end solution for this. But a plastic box, that's a low-end solution. I like low-end solutions. And then safe work practices. So the big ones, and we'll talk about all of them, good housekeeping and hygiene, documentation, and personal protective equipment. So housekeeping. 
if we keep everything clean, there's less chance of the contaminants that are just floating around in the air hurting us. So minimizing any kind of dust or particulate material, dusting, sweeping. Um, if you're going to reuse storage containers, you want to clean them very well. You might, depending on what you're, if it's a, corrugate, if it's a cardboard storage container that you think is, has something hazardous in it, you can't clean it, just get rid of it. If it's something plastic or metal, you can probably clean it with a solution of bleach and water and then rinse it really well. Let it dry for several days to make sure it's all dry and reuse it. When you're working with artifacts, it's a good idea to cover the work surface with paper, blotter, something that you can remove and just throw away so that your table doesn't get any kind of contaminant rubbed into it. Hazardous materials should be kept separately from non-hazardous materials. Uh, the less you handle anything, the less chance of you coming in con into contact with contaminants. Also, the less you handle anything, the less chance you have of breaking it. Minim minimizing handling is always good. And then think about your protocols for any procedures that you have and see if there are ways you can minimize human risk. Um, least amount of exposure, what kind of equipment you need, et cetera. As far as hygiene, hopefully nobody is smoking in their workspace at this point. But just in case, I have seen places where people have snuck cigarettes in collection areas. Um, no eating or drinking in your workspaces. Washing your hands frequently. And avoid touching your face, which can be really, really, really difficult. Um, Wash your hands before you freshen up your lipstick or bite your fingernails or brush your hair. And wash your hands before you leave work. So pretty basic stuff. The next thing is documentation, which you use to alert staff to and visitors about hazards. So that's things like putting warning signs on your objects and your storage containers and the entrances letting people know what hazards might be present. Um, one of the things that I like to do, for example, I'm a book and paper person. I do a lot of mold remediation. If I remediate the mold off of a book, I'll make a box for it and then put a label on the box saying this book has been treated for mold. Proceed with care. And that way, anyone who knows that they have a mold sensitivity can decide in an informed way whether they want to handle that object or not. And that's not a huge deal. You also, if you suspect a contaminant, you should make a note in the catalog record so anyone looking at that understands. For chemicals that you have around that might be challenge, might be toxic or hazardous, you want to get a hold of the MSDS, which is the Manufacturer's Safety Data Sheet, and keep them, usually people keep them in a binder. So any cleaning materials that you use, cleaning chemicals your housekeeping crew uses, any solvents that you have around that are working on collections, hang on to those because they have safety information. And they will tell you things like, these are the potential hazards. This can be inhaled. This can be ingested. The possible effects are shortness of breath or burning of your skin or death, and they will tell you, you know, this is carcinogen, what kind of emergency first aid do you need to use, can you flush your eyes with water or do you, not need, do you need to not do that, do you drink milk if it's a poison that's in, been ingested or do you not because certain poisons want that. It'll tell you what kind of personal protective equipment to wear when you are dealing with that substance. They're a wealth of information and Really, anything you buy that could be hazardous, you should get the MSDS. And if you ask the manufacturer for the MSDS, by law, they have to give it to you. That's the whole point. Then one last thing for taking care of yourself, vaccines. If you work with collections, you should have a tetanus shot and update it every 10 years. Because you don't want to get lockjaw. That would be unpleasant for everyone. If you are an emergency first responder and you go in after major disasters and work with collections, 
you want to get your hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccines as well. But the big one is a tetanus shot. And chances are, if you're like most people I know, it may have been more than 10 years since you got yours. I know that mine had been at least 20 the last time I had it updated, but now I'm good for another seven years. And that kind of segues us into personal protective equipment. That can be a lot of things. It can be, we're going to talk in depth about respirators because I think they're incredibly important. We're going to talk a little about gloves. It might be safety goggles, eye protection, ear protection if you're working somewhere loud, uh, protective clothing like lab coats, Tyvek suits to keep you completely covered up. So, gloves. For gloves, nitrile are usually pre pre preferred over rubber or latex. So nitrile are the ones that are usually colored, and they come in a rainbow. Um, when you work with chemicals, though, there are charts out there. If you Google what kind of gloves should I use, you'll come up with all the charts that tell you this is good for this kind of glove chemical, this is good for this kind of chemical. For most museum applications, nitrile are what we want. And for museum work, the color isn't usually a consideration. So if you want to buy the pink, you go right ahead and have the pink gloves. It's fine. Um, there are some professions. Law enforcement usually like black. It distinguishes them from other kinds of first responders. Tattoo artists also like black. Apparently, it doesn't show the blood as much. Um, Medical usually uses blue, et cetera, et cetera. But for museums, there's no standard. So purple, pink, green, go crazy. When you put them on, actually, let me, I think I actually have an on slide. So while we're on the subject, white cotton gloves. Everyone likes the idea of white cotton gloves. They are totally useless in terms of protecting you. Right, that cotton just breathes, everything goes right through it. They're, all, it's, they're also not particularly great for artifacts because they're slippery and they're hard to hold on to things. You lose a lot of manual dexterity. So if you're a white cotton glove person, change to nitrile. You'll be better off. Um, so glove usage. When you put them on, check them for any kind of punctures or tears or signs of deterioration. And if you're going to be working with something sharp that might puncture your gloves, you can put one, a different colored one over the top of your, so two double glove and have like a pink over your blue. And that makes it really easy to tell if you have new punctures because you'll see the pink underneath. Um, replace them frequently, especially if you splash them with a chemical and don't reuse them. So when you take gloves off, so putting them on, pretty self-explanatory. Look, make sure they're OK. When you take them off, you take them off inside out. So I take this one off with this hand and hold it. And then I take this one off and kind of wrap the gloves up so I never have to touch the inside of the glove. I'm sorry, I never have to touch the outside of the glove. And then I just take them over the trash can throw them away, go wash my hands. And don't wear your contaminated gloves when you're touching things like doorknobs, elevator buttons, um, communal telephones, anything that you might touch without your gloves on because you'll offset some of that hazard and then the next person to come on and push that elevator button and then run their hand through their hair now has arsenic in their hair. Um, lab coats, Tyvek suits are really great for keeping you safe from particulates. Lab coats are washable. You probably don't want to take them and wash them in your home washing machine if you can help it. But if you have to, you may end up doing that. Tyvek suits are disposable. They can be a little expensive. If you have very limited need for something like that, you might call the local funeral home and talk to them because they have undertakers body removal suits that are basically Tyvek suits and they come with everything from booties to headgear fairly inexpensively and they might be willing to donate you some 
or sell you some much more cheaply than a full out Tyvek suit. Um, and it's kind of fun to have Undertaker's body removal suits hanging around. Um, or maybe it isn't. But um, Respirators. So I've got a lot to say about respirators because it's really one of my big interests right now. An air purifying respirator is a respirator that has a filter, cartridge, or canister that removes a specific air contaminant by passing ambient air through the air purifying element. And that's the OSHA standard definition for a respirator. They are one of the most important pieces of safety equipment you can have. And you want to use them anytime you could inhale something toxic. So mold, solvent vapors, acids from deteriorating film. Um, you don't want to be breathing in acetic acid for three hours. It's just, it's, it will burn your lungs. Um, asbestos, lead, arsenic, you name it. If you don't want to breathe it, the respirator is your friend. The government sets up a couple of categories of respirator use. There may be a mandatory respirator use. Um, when you have inhaled hazards over OSHA's permissible exposure limit, and that's when those OSHA consultants are going to be really helpful. They'll come in and see if you have anything that's over the permissible exposure limit. And it's free. If you have a mandatory respirator program, uh, it's going to be a written policy. It will tell you how to select your respirator. It will train your staff. You'll have to go and sit through a respirator safety training lecture. It'll be so exciting. No, it won't. Um, you have to do a medical evaluation. You have to have a respirator fit test. You'll learn how to use your respirator during routine conditions, emergency conditions. And you'll learn, it'll establish programs for schedules of cleaning, disinfecting, storing, inspecting, replacing, um, and otherwise maintaining your respirators. Because you know they affect your lungs. You need to know how to do all of these things. And the program gets evaluated regularly to make sure it's still doing its job. Chances are, if you're sitting in this room, you, you are more likely to be falling under a voluntary respirator use program, um, even if it's just that your little teeny tiny museum, even though they probably should, they have so much on their plate that they're not going to put together a mandatory respirator use program for you unless you push it. But you can still, and I'm not saying that's a good thing, I'm just saying that that's sometimes how the world works. But you still can do a voluntary respirator use program. Um, that's for protection against hazards that are below the exposure level, um, for comfort in situations with airborne particles. If you think you need a respirator, that's when you would use it. Um, it doesn't have to be written, but you do have to be told what kind of respirator you need. You do have to have a medical evaluation done. You have to get fit tested. You can't use a respirator safely without being fit tested. You must know how to tell your respirator from my respirator so that I use my respirator that's a medium, you use your respirator that's a small, and we all have our respirators fit. And you have to only use your respirator in areas where it will protect you. So if my respirator protects me against particulates but not solvent fumes, I can't use it to try to protect me from solvent fumes because it's not going to. Um, there are a lot of kinds of respirators. I brought my big old half mask elastomer heavy duty canisters. Fits over your head. Incredibly uncomfortable, not a lot of fun, but very safe respirator. There are also disposable respirators. Oh, come here. These are N95 masks that you can usually pick up at a hardware store. They just need to be rated N95. They'll say it on them. Um, they have to be NIOSH approved. NIOSH, um, National, I can't remember. The SH is Safety and Health. Um, you also can buy full face respirators. Some people can't wear half mask respirators. For example, if they have 
beards. You can't get a good seal on a half mask respirator, but you can get a full face respirator and do that. Disposable respirators don't work for any kind of fumes, gases, vapors. They are very appropriate for mold, dust, residues, pesticides, things like that. They should be fit tested. Um, fit testing, I didn't bring my fit testing equipment. I know you're devastated that you're not going to get to see it, but the box is big and I couldn't fit it in my suitcase from Texas. Basically, you put your respirator on and you put a hood on over that and we spray a bitter solution at you and make you do all kinds of things like march in place and deep breathing and bending over and nodding your head and shaking your head back and forth. And after about five minutes of doing different tests, if you still aren't smelling the bitter or tasting the bitter, you can be pretty sure that nothing is getting in around your respirator. Um, and then if you're really lucky and you have a nice fit tester, they give you a piece of chocolate <coughs> to take away the bitter taste. Um, and these respirators, the big respirators can be fitted. The disposables should also be fitted. The same way? Yes. So that you know, I mean, they're disposable. You don't fit every single time you use it. But that way you know that this particular respirator will work for you. Um, right, this is a 3M8110 size small. But if you have a bigger face, you might need a medium and the small won't do it for you. If you have a small face, the medium won't work because it'll just gap everywhere. Um, if, you're by, if you're using a half mask or full face respirator, they have these cartridges that screw on and off so you can make it applicable to these ones. Now I'm totally walking around and getting in the way. But these have a little filter in them kind of like the same, like a miniature of the filter in your air conditioning unit, your heater. And this is for particulate. Solvents will have pads that absorb and neutralize the solvent fumes, solvent vapors. For most museum applications, P100 is the specification that you want. Um, that's for particulates. But there are also filters for gas and for vapors. And you use the right filter for the right application. So people who can wear a respirator. First, you have to pass a medical evaluation to make sure that you're not going to hurt yourself by wearing a respirator. So if you're pregnant, you're probably not going to get to wear a respirator. If you have a heart condition or if you have lung issues, you're probably not going to get to wear a respirator. If you're 19 years old. You're probably not going to get to wear a respirator. But talk to the doctor. If they're 92 and in really good shape, the doctor may say yes. I'm not. Our oldest elder traveling is 92 years old, and we already know that we have to wear hazmat suits. And <sighs> Delightful. Yeah. Um, but the good thing about this is this, well, it may not be, you may not see it as a good thing. But this is something, it's not coming from you. It's coming from the law. And they can fine you pretty seriously if they find out that you're letting somebody who's, who can't safely wear a respirator use one. So um, you can pass the buck on up the ladder. Um, you also have to be clean shaven for a half mask respirator. Because with all that hair on your face, you can't get a good strong seal. You have to have been trained in how to use and care for them, and you have to have been fit tested. They don't last forever. Um, some cartridges have expiration dates. Some cartridges only ha work for a little while. Um, if you don't keep your cartridge in an airtight container, it's going to be absorbing even when you're not using it. The little disposables only last, you know, you might not need to throw them away every single use, but you want to change them out really frequently. If nothing else, they get all kind of grimy on the, where they touch your skin. And that can lead to dermatitis. And the plastics in the respirator will eventually break down and become brittle instead of nice and squishy and soft like this. 
respirators need to be kept super clean because, yeah, they will get the oils from your skin on them and then they'll get dirty, clog all your pores, you'll get a horrible case of dermatitis, it's really uncomfortable. So you take them apart and wash them and disinfect them in a solution of bleach and water and rinse them and let them dry and inspect them again. Um, you inspect for tightness of your connections, make sure you have no straps that are broken. I had a respirator once that got old and one of the straps broke off. All of a sudden I couldn't keep it tight on my head anymore. Once the flexible stuff loses its flexibility, it doesn't form a good seal. Um, anytime it deteriorates, replace it. And um, donning your respirator, putting it on. So I'm going to put both of these on so that you've seen it happen. And I'm going to put my hair back because it'll be in the way. Sorry, I should have thought to do this before the talk. So for disposable, super easy. The straps go there. You put it in your hand and it goes there, over your mouth, over the back of your head. And then can you see this little metal that pinches around your nose so that you don't have any holes right there? It also makes you talk very nasally because you're probably going to be clamping your nostrils shut. And then you do something that's called a pressure check to make sure that you're not getting any air in around the edges. So you put your hands over it and breathe in. And you should feel it kind of collapse against your face and breathe out. And you shouldn't feel anything coming out around the edges. You should only feel things coming out around through the front. To take it off, back one, bottom one first, followed by the top one, and then you can just throw it away. Or put it away until the next time you use it, when it gets dirty, throw it away. Apparently I got lipstick on this one, I'm not going to keep it. These, a little more of a production. strap on here, take my glasses off so I can get a seal. Then there's these straps that fasten in the back. And now my little, you can't hear me, can you? A little bit. This is the, Luke, I am your father. Um, so to do your pressure test, you put your hands over the filters and breathe in. Can you see it sucking up to my nose? That's exactly what we want. Breathe. This is where the air comes back out. Put your hand over that and go. And you shouldn't feel anything coming around the edges. To take it off, bam, clean it, put it away. Replace your cartridge per the schedule. Store them in an airtight container. Protect them from contaminants and sunlight, which will break down the plastic, dust, chemicals. Don't crush them. And, you know, treat them like the important piece of safety equipment they are. Respirators aren't particularly expensive. The bases cost like 35 bucks, and then these cartridges cost six or seven bucks a pair. And these guys are really cheap. They're a couple bucks a hit. You know, you buy them in a box of 10 for 20 bucks. Probably more if you buy in bulk. Um, fit testing should be done annually. You can talk to your local OSHA office for advice on who can do that locally. Or you can go to Granger.com and buy the fit testing kit yourself. It's like a couple hundred bucks. For medical evaluations, there's a particular OSHA form that has to get used. You give that to your doctor and then they give you a letter saying you're safe. If that's too much, 3M will let you go online, type information in about your health. Their doctors will evaluate it. 
and send you back a letter saying yes or no. As I recall, that's like 30 bucks. So that may be easier. And the last thing I want to talk about is protection during emergency response. If you're ever hit with a tornado, flood, hurricane, earthquake, you know, we're, depending on where you are in the country, you have your own unique and exquisite forms of, geoli of meteorological torture. In, in Texas, we're prone to hurricanes on the coast, tornadoes in the panhandle, earthquakes going up and down the middle of the state. We get it all. So things to ask yourself before you respond. Are you healthy enough? Can you do this? If you have high blood pressure, that may be exacerbated by having to wear your personal protective equipment. Do you have the physical stamina for the long days of work disasters take? Um, are you emotionally ready to do this? Does that, disasters are really taxing. Uh, and if you, emotion, if you can't handle it emotionally, you're better off to just not go because if you become a liability, you slow everyone down. Um, you want to make sure your immu Im immunizations are up to date and your respirator fit test is current. Then you have to start thinking about, is your site safe to enter? If you're in a restricted area, you need to have official clearance to enter. And there may be cur um, curfews and restrictions that um, affect your ability to respond. You need to obey them. You don't want to, it's not worth getting arrested, right? Remember, you're more important than any stuff. Don't go in unless you're told it's safe. Are there sources of, for food and water? You don't want to go unless you can eat and drink. And if you need any kind of special ID, make sure you keep it on you. Once you get there, um, you need to know your limits. It doesn't help anyone if you push yourself until you're exhausted and then you have to go to the hospital because you're dehydrated or have heat stroke or something like that. Um, your health and safety is your first priority. There's a theme and it's your first responsibility. Take breaks, drink water, eat snacks, sleep. Do not overdo it. Disaster recovery, disaster response recovery is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, common sense stuff. If you're going in somewhere scary, if you're going in after a Hurricane Sandy or a major tornado or an earthquake, go with a buddy and never get out of visual or audible communication with that person so they know that you're safe. Somebody needs to know where you are at all times, so that if there's another crisis, they can get you and find you. Schedule rendezvous points and meet up frequently. Um, wash your hands, even if you're wearing gloves. Keep your work area tidy. Carry wipes and hand sanitizer if the water supply is questionable. Um, and then you can think about the weather. So is it hot? You have risk of fatigue, dizziness, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, sunburn. If I even walk out in the sun, I get sunburned. Yeah. So use sunscreen, work in the coolest time of the day. So you know, there's a reason that siesta is a really good thing. Work from 7 until 1, and then work from 4 until 7. Take a nice long break. Um, take breaks. When I'm doing any kind of emergency response, I, I break at least 10 minutes an hour walk away from it, give myself a chance to recover, uh, give myself a chance to sit down, focus myself again and come back. Keep hydrated. If you need medical help, seek it quickly. Don't wait until you're past the point of no return. If it's cold, it might even be worse. Numb extremities, frostbite, hypothermia. So you need to limit your exposure. Take breaks in warm places. Um, oftentimes when you're cold, you'll wear many, many, many layers, and the bottom ones will get sweat soaked because you're so hot underneath it all. And then you'll get a chill, and you'll be sitting in soaking wet, freezing cold clothing. And again, seek medical help if necessary. If it's wet, so you're dealing with flood conditions, 
Um, the risks are hypothermia and drowning. So wear your PPE. If the water is more than two inches deep, don't go wading because you can't see the bottom and you don't know what's going to be down there. Um, if you have to go into water for some reason, take a pole or a broomstick and use it to kind of test the waters before you move so that you know you're not walking into a pothole or disturbing a sea creature, whatever is down there. Again, brakes, wet shoes and socks are really bad for you. They will damage your skin, so change them. And again, if you need it, medical help. Physical things, don't lift materials that you can't carry. If you need two people, if you need help, get help. Stretch, stretching is really good. Um, remember that wet materials are very, very heavy. If you have never soaked a phone book, it's an interesting experiment. Go home, grab an old phone book, soak it for a couple days, and see how big and heavy and wet it gets. It'll weigh four times as much as it did when it was dry. If you haven't been trained to operate that forklift, don't operate that forklift. And if the area is noisy, wear your hearing protection because you don't want to damage your ears. And you may need to end, if you're wearing hearing protection, you may need to arrange a visual signal so that somebody, you know, people know you're wearing your hearing protection, they need to get your attention, they know they do like, they do like this, you'll stop what you're doing and pay attention to them. If you, have airborne, if you have airborne particulates like sawdust, sand, wear your, eye, wear your safety glasses so that you don't get specks of dust in your eye, which hurts. For mold, mold remediation, um, I do a lot of mold remediation. If it's really, so I always wear my respirator. Um, if it's, depending on the degree of the mold, I'll wear my safety goggles. Cover your hair. Shower caps work really well. You can get really cute shower caps with bows on them and stuff. Wear your gloves. Um, take breaks. You don't want to wear your respirator for three hours at a hit. You want to take, you know, again, I do 10 minutes an hour of a break from my respirator so that I can get some fresh air, so that my face can relax after having that thing stuck on it like, like glue. Um, wash your hands frequently. While you're working with mold, don't itch your hair or touch your face. Um, it's so hard. We don't realize how often we touch our face. One, two, every, yeah. We don't realize how often we touch our face until we go, oh, I can't touch my face. Um, let me make sure I get all my notes. So you will see, if you're in a major disaster, you will see all kinds of crazy animals and insects and plants just because everything is disrupted. So if you're moving piles of debris, you want to be very careful. You might use a wood or plastic probe before reaching into dimly lit spaces. You don't want to surprise a snake or a rodent or something else. Stray animals should be left alone. Don't approach them. If you find an animal that's ill or injured, call animal control. Um, and if you are bitten by an animal or an insect, um, seek medical attention. And I'm going to just, since I have a recent insect bite horror story, I'm just going to share it with everyone so you can learn from my experience. Like a month ago, I have a feeling I might have been working with collections and this happened and I didn't notice it, but I ended up with one, two, three insect bites that hadn't gone away after a week, and my arm swelled up like a football, and I ended up having to go to the doctor and get antibiotics and steroids, and it took, well, it's a month out, a month and a half out, and it's still not completely healed. So um, if I would have gone a couple days after it happened when it wasn't going away quickly, I probably wouldn't have had to deal with all of that. So you can learn from my example. If it's a weird insect bite, get treatment. Um, if you are tick bite, get treatment. Now for snake bites, if you can figure out what kind of a snake you were bitten by, that's helpful. Um, and wear bug, bug spray. Um, 
learn how, learn how to recognize toxic plants, poison ivy, poison oak, anything else that you're allergic to. And again, wash your hands and your clothes after exposure. Um, and wash your contaminated clothing separate, separately from your non-contaminated clothing. There are some building hazards out there. Don't go in until you're cleared. You want to make sure that the building is stable. It's not going to collapse around you. Um, even if you're cleared, the situation can change. So be aware of any kind of instability that you see. Uh, if you see shelving teetering, that's a good indicator that you might not want to be in there right now. If you hear any kind of shifting or noise that indicates that the building is moving, you might not want to be in there. Um, if there's any kind of a fire protect, if the fire protection system is impaired, have something else in place, somebody keeping watch to make sure there is no fire. Um, oh, I missed electrical. If the room is flooded, don't go in unless you know the power is off because water conducts electricity and you don't want to get shocked. Likewise, be very aware of down power lines because they are dangerous. And don't forget the most important thing to take away from this is your safety is the most important thing above any collections objects ever. So take care of yourself first we can get more stuff. And um, if you have questions now, that's awesome. I also realize that it is the last session after a very full two days of conferencing. And you may be kind of going, I probably have questions, but I don't know what they are. Um, if that's the case, wow, you sure can't see my e that That's very low contrast. Um, my email address is RebeccaElder at Austin.rr.com, or you can contact me through my website. I love to answer questions about this kind of, well, I love to answer any kind of questions, but don't hesitate to shoot me an email. If I don't have an answer, I can probably find it quickly. Oh, and it's also at the top of your handout, so um, thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate you. you sticking it out till the bitter end. I do have some questions. Oh, awesome. <laughs>